بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم لا سهل إلا ما جعلته سهلا وأنت تجعل الحزن إذا شئت سهلا رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for making us Muslims and we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for making us of the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala jalla fi ulah that he has made us insha'Allah ta'ala from the people of the Qur'an. And this ummah, they are the people of the Qur'an. There is what is known as Ahlul Qur'ani Ammah and Ahlul Qur'ani Khassah. So all of the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Every single Muslim and every single Muslim that believes in La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah, they are Ahlul Qur'an. Because this kitab, it is their kitab. Our kitab is not the Torah. It is not the Injil. It is not the Zabur. It is not Suhufi, Ibrahim, or Musa. Our kitab, it is the Qur'an al-Kareem. So we are the Ummah of the Qur'an. So this is Ahlul Qur'an, the general Ahlul Qur'an. And then we have the specific Ahlul Qur'an, and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of them. It's taken from the hadith in the Sahih. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Inna lillahi ahlina min nas Indeed, Allah jalla wa ala, from all of the people, he has a group. So the companions, they read the Qur'an from cover to cover many times. And they said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, man hum, who are these people? We read in the Qur'an that Allah jalla wa ala, he has no family. He has no spouse. He has no children. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. وَلَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ كُفُوًا أَحَدٍ لَمْ يَتَّخِذْ صَاحِبَةً وَلَا وَلَدًا Nobody is attached to Allah. Who is this Ahl? Who is this Ahl that you speak of, O Messenger of Allah? So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Ahlul Qur'an. Ahlul Qur'an. Hum Ahlullah. They are the people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And not only that, they are the khassa. They are the ones that are close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are the ones that are dear to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are the ones that are very special to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is Ahlul Qur'ani khassa. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of them as well. I'm very delighted and joyful, as you can see the smile on my face, to be in Masjid al-Salam delivering a lecture. And I have prayed in Masjid al-Salam before. I prayed over there and I prayed over there and I prayed in different places. But I would come in and I would go out. And Sheikh Hassan, he kindly invited us to come today. And I'm very uh, delighted for the invitation. And I wanted to thank the masjid and the people of the masjid and the community. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make this a beneficial reminder, insha'Allah ta'ala. So, we have the companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by the name of Dhun Nurain. Do we know who Dhun Nurain is? If you do, raise your hands. Who is Dhun Nurain? Yes. Uthman ibn Affan. Uthman ibn Affan, the great companion of the Prophet ﷺ, his name, his title, it was Dhul Nurain, the possessor of two lights. And they said that he had this name because he married two daughters of the Prophet ﷺ. He married one and she passed away. And then he married a second one. And then Muslims are those who have learned the Quran and they have taught the Quran al kareem I heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say that the best amongst you Muslims is the one who has learned the Qur'an al kareem and then he has taught it to those who have come after. And if we analyze the kitab of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we will find that Allah jalla wa ala, he has divided all of Bashariya, all of humanity into two groups. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا مِنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ وَالْمُشْرِكِينَ فِي نَارِ جَهَنَّمَ خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said, those who have disbelieved from the people of the book and the mushrikun, the polytheists, they are fi nari jahannam. They will be in the fire of jahannam. They will remain in there forever. Anybody who doesn't believe in La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah, his abode is Jahannam and he will never come out. This is not my law, it is the law of Allah. Anyone who doesn't believe in La ilaha illallah, there is no abode for him except Jahannam. Allah said, Ula'ika, those people, whom they are, Sharrul Bariya, they are the worst of creation. 
Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He spoke about the second group and He said, Indeed, those who have believed, the mu'minun, and those who have done righteous actions, amilu salihat, us, the muslimin, we say la ilaha illallah, and we believe in la ilaha illallah, and we act by la ilaha illallah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, He said that these people, Allah jalla wa ala, He said that these people, they are the best of creation. So the Muslim is the best already. Whilst you are the best amongst you Muslims, they are those who are even better. خيركم أي أنتم خير البرية وخيركم من تعلم القرآن وعلمه. You are already the best, but the best of the best. They are those who have learned the Kitab of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala and those who have taught it to other people. This may not be the case on earth, though. When you are on earth, people they have different yardsticks. One person he thinks a successful person is a doctor. Another one thinks the successful one is the businessman. Another one thinks the successful one is the architect or the engineer. But that is your yardstick. That is your perspective. That is what you think. That's up to you. It is your position. You can keep your position. We respect your position. But Allah Jalla wa Ala, He said something else. He never said that the engineer or the architect or the doctor, he is khayrun nas. He never said that he is ahlullahi wa khasatu. He never said that. So that means in the sight of Allah, things are very different. In the sight of Allah, the one who has the highest rank, it is the person of the Quran. The Prophet ﷺ, he said that this person, Yawm Al-Qiyamah, Surah Al-Baqarah, and Surah Ali Imran, the two large surahs of the Quran, they will come and they will argue his entire case, Yawm Al-Qiyamah. They will intercede for him. They will stand before him and they will defend him before Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, Iqra'u Al-Quran. Read the Quran whilst you still can, whilst you are breathing, whilst you have the opportunity. You still have a chance. You are still here in the dunya. You do not know when you are going to pass away. How many people do you know that have passed away at a time that was unexpected? So sudden, they left this world. Baltatan, Allah mentions in the Quran. It just comes by surprise. Allah Jalla wa even mentions in the Quran, when these people, they leave the dunya, they are unable to give a farewell reminder. They are unable to speak to their families and tell them, you know, I left some money here. There's some savings. Take this money for the children. Take this money for the wife. Take this money for my mother. They can't say this. They can't give any farewell reminder, any wasiyah. You cannot. Allah Jalla wa Ala, He made this a hukum. Every single person will taste death. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, He spoke about this in the Sunnah. And He said that this is This is the destroyer of all pleasures. Imagine now. Imagine that every single person on this earth agrees with this. Every single person. The Muslim and the non-Muslim. The old and the young. The white and the black. The one who lives in a Muslim land, the one who lives in a non-Muslim land. The sinner, the pious. It is a universal concept. Everybody agrees that you're going to die. What people differ with is what happens next. Some believe in Allah, some believe in Akhirah, some believe in resurrection, some believe in nothing. But that is after death. As for death, everyone agrees with this. So imagine you know you're going to die and you're only going to live for 60 to 70 years. This ummah, they have the smallest lifespan. We have the shortest lifespan. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, أَعْمَارُ أُمَّتِي مَا بَيْنَ السِّتِّينَ إِلَى السَّبْعِينَ وَقَلِيلٌ مَنْ يَجُوزُ ذَلِكَ The average lifespan of this ummah is between 60 and 70 years old. Only a few people are going to pass this. What are you going to do in your lifetime for these 60 to 70 years? What are you going to pour into your heart? Are you going to pour into your heart the ayat and the surah of the Quran and Kareem? Or are you going to return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a heart filled with other things? Most of the time rubbish. Things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not interested in. Things that you are interested in. So if it is the case that you can admit yourself into paradise, then fill your heart with that which you like and then put yourself into paradise. But you cannot. So if it's Allah that is going to put you into paradise, you fill your heart with that which Allah loves. And there is nothing ever has been placed in this earth that is more beloved to Allah than his speech, than his kalam. This is the most beloved thing to Allah. The Prophet ﷺ, he said this body, the entire body, from head to toe, it has a limb, an organ. This organ, it is the most important organ. If it is upright, if it is sound, if it is pure, every single other part of the body, it is also sound and pure. If it is impure and corrupt, you are no good. Everything about you is also bad. 
A person can't say, Wallahi, my heart isn't very good, but I'm a, I'm a good person. You can't be. Because either you're telling the truth, or the Prophet is telling the truth. And you will not dare to say that you are telling the truth, and the Prophet is not. So that means you're not telling the truth. If your heart is no good, you are no good. Your actions will be no good. Your speech will be no good. Your dealings with other people will be no good. Everything you do will be no good. The Prophet ﷺ, he said that this is the heart. This is the heart. Imagine now an example. You bring dessert uh, from CJ's or you bring dessert. Uh, CJ's is a very nice restaurant, by the way. We really like it. You bring dessert from such a place, you bring it, and then you offer it to all of the people. Everybody says, this is very nice. We like this dessert. They bring it to you and you say, it's not nice. And all the people are wrong and you are right. The Jamahir, they are all wrong. And this person, he's shad, he's by himself. He's the right one? No. We say you're the wrong one and everybody else is right. But this person who is saying, I can't taste anything from this cake, this dessert. Is the problem with the dessert or is the problem with him? That's the question. The person who says the dessert is not nice when it is. Is the problem with him or the dessert? It's a question. You guys don't answer questions over here. In the UK, when we ask questions, everyone answers. It's with him. So we say, you have, ya akhi, you have a problem with your taste buds, your tongue, your mouth. Something's wrong. Go see a doctor. That's what we have to say. Something wrong with you. So if the person picks up the Quran, this is the analogy. You pick up the Quran, you're unable to read it. You want to put it down. You have to admit, firstly, if you want to become connected to the Quran, this title, this lecture was entitled, Those Who Are Connected to the Quran. If you want to become from those who are connected to the Quran, the first step is to admit that there's a problem. The first step. And this egotistic behavior with Allah doesn't work. This kibr. And Allah Jalla wa says, Asrifu an ayati alladheena yatakabbaroona fil ardi bighayri alhaq. These ayat of mine, I will divert it from those who are arrogant on the earth with no right. Sufyan ibn Uyayna, from the scholars of the past, he said, Ay, أَحْرِمْهُمْ فَهْمَ الْقُرْآنِ This is what it means. So, أَصْرِفُ عَنْ آيَاتِيَ الَّذِينَ يَتَكَبَّرُونَ فِي الْأَرْضِ بِغَيْرِ الْحَقِّ It means, Allah will prevent you from understanding the Qur'an. Allah will prevent you from tasting the sweetness of the Qur'an. You will not. So you cannot be a person who has an ego or kibr. Admit there's a problem. This is the first step. Once you do this, now there's a remedy for you. But the remedy is for the one who's going to accept it. What is the remedy you have to do? You have to pour out all of the impurities from this heart. Istighfar. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, I make istighfar every single day 70 times. In another riwayah, 100 times. He said, وَإِنَّهُ لَيُغَانُ عَلَىٰ قَلْبِي The Prophet ﷺ, he said, I feel ghayn. Ghayn, the scholars they say, it is the lightest type of cover. The heaviest type of cover, it is the one that's mentioned in Surah Al-Mutaffifin. كَلَّا بَلْ رَانَ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِهِمْ مَا كَانُوا يَكْسِبُونَ What is ran? Ran is a very heavy cover on the heart. So this ran will be on the heart, nothing can come through. No khair can come through. The Prophet ﷺ said, the person who reaches this level, لَا يَعْرِفُ مَعْرُوفًا وَلَا يُنْكِرُ مُنْكَرًا Any good that comes, he won't accept it. Any bad that comes, he won't reject it. His whole life has become upside down, 180. All the good, he sees it to be bad. All the bad, he sees it to be good. If you invite him to the houses of Allah, the masajid, the most beloved places on the earth of Allah, أَحَبُّ الْبِقَاعِ فِي الْأَرْضِ إِلَى اللَّهِ مَسَاجِدُهَا The houses of Allah are the most beloved places to Allah on the earth. You say, Ya Akhi, come to Salatul Isha. Come to Salatul Maghrib. Come for Salatul Jum'ah. They don't want to go. But you say, come to another place of haram and disobedience, they will go. This person is a sign that there is something on their heart. وَبِالتَّالِي This person will not be able to benefit from the Qur'an. So the first thing to clean the heart, it is istighfar. This is the first thing. To connect with the Qur'an, it is istighfar. The second thing is, after you make istighfar, you make a lot of dua. This Qur'an, it belongs to Allah. You have to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to open up the Qur'an for you. Oh Allah, make me from those who connect with your speech. O oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, allow me to taste the sweetness of your kalam. O oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, pour the Qur'an into my heart. Make dua to Allah and combine between your efforts and the requests from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the second step. The first step, it was what? Istighfar. The second one was a dua. 
The third one, it is to be consistent. Don't do one day and leave one week. This is wrong. Do every single day. Even if it's an ayah or two. Even if it is half of that. Even if it's more than that. Whatever it is, the amount is not important. It is being regular every single day. The Prophet ﷺ said, this is the most beloved action to Allah. That you do something small, but you continue it for a long time. Make sense? I'll give you an example. On Friday, we read Surah Al-Kahf. Sometimes you find a brother, mashallah, young brother, he's very strong and fit. So body-wise, his physique, mashallah, he's taking care of it. But when he opens up the Quran, he reads a little bit, and then he's tired. His heart has very weak stamina. We know stamina, right? Stamina is when you are running and you are exercising. The longer you go, the better stamina you have. But his spiritual stamina is weak. And another question before I come back to this. I'll come back to this. Just so this makes a lot of sense. Sometimes we find a very elderly uncle, Shayba, Kabir al-Sin. He's able to come to the masjid from somewhere far away on a walking stick. Maybe it's raining, maybe it's very cold, and he's walking meters and meters, yards and yards, maybe miles and miles to come to the masjid. You find a young person, he lives next to the masjid, he can't come. So if the old man is able to come and he's physically weak, and the young man is unable to come and he's physically strong, now you understand the mas'ala is not to do with how strong or how weak you are physically, it is to do with the heart. وَلِذَلِكَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he doesn't look at how you look. إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَنظُرُ إِلَىٰ صُوَرِكُمْ وَلَا إِلَىٰ أَجْسَامِكُمْ وَلَكِنْ يَنظُرُ إِلَىٰ قُلُوبِكُمْ وَأَحْمَالِكُمْ Allah doesn't look at how you look. Allah looks at how your heart is. So going back to this now, you have to be committed. You can't read one Jews and two Jews and three Jews and four Jews and be like uh, Sheikh Abdul Rashid overnight. You cannot be like this. But there's a place that people like Sheikh Abdul Rashid who are the legends of the Quran started from. You need to start from them. And then you reach their level or you may even pass their level. So what do you do? On Friday, we read Surah Al-Kahf, right? You begin Surah Al-Kahf. When you start, after a while, you may feel like, I can't continue anymore. I need to put the Quran down. When you reach this level, this is when you're meant to continue. This is when the shaitan is playing a trick with you. So you continue, you read two pages, three pages, for example. Now he's saying, stop. Here, this is the worst time to stop. The worst. If you break the shackles of the shaitan, you seek refuge from Allah, what is going to happen is, after you continue, the recitation that has come next, it is going to be sweeter than the first one. The recitation that comes next, it is going to be from the heart. It is going to flow more. You are going to enjoy it more. Then you're not going to put the Quran down. Similarly, when the young brothers are in the gym and you are pulling the weights up, you continue and you continue and you continue until you find it very difficult. Your muscles are hurting. You can't push it up. Then you have the person behind you in the UK. We call it a person who spots you. He's behind you. He's helping you. So you think you are doing it, but he pushed it up, right? He pushed it up. This is a mindset. He's pretending he pushed, you pushed it up, but he actually pushed it up for you. But when he tells you, continue, continue, now you're motivated. Now the mindset comes back. Now the muscles are working and you are able to continue again. The Quran is not like this. The Quran is easier than this. But don't give up. You continue and you continue and you continue. And the Quran is not a big book. And look how small the Quran is. That's a small book. Do we agree it's a small book? Who thinks it's a big book? <laughs> if you think it's a big book, raise your hands. And be honest. If you think it's a small book, raise your hands. It's a small book. The works of the ulama, when they explain this Quran, it is bigger than this. You guys seen the tafsir of Al-Imam Ibn Kathir? Have you seen the tafsir of Al-Imam Ibn Jarir al-Tabari? How big it is? You're not being asked to memorize volumes and volumes. You're being asked to memorize 600 pages. And you've seen little children do it. You've seen non-Arabs do it. You've seen an old man or an old lady do it. Why can't you do it as well? The first thing we said, it is al-istighfar. The second thing we said, it is what? Al-du'a. The third thing we said is what? Consistency. If you have ikhlas, if you make istighfar, if you make du'a, if you are consistent, why wouldn't Allah give you the Qur'an? Anybody who is unable to learn the Qur'an or connect with the Qur'an, it is because they are making a mistake in one of those areas. Maybe they don't have ikhlas. 
they're learning the Quran so they be can become a qari. They become famous. They can become a person who records videos. If this is your intention, then it's not for Allah. Allah will make the path difficult. Or maybe it is for Allah, but they don't put in any time. We said be consistent, right? They're not putting in time. They're busy. They don't have time for Allah's speech. The Quran, we don't have time for it. We have time for everything else. We have time for our business and our work and our family and social life and football. We don't have time for the Quran. We don't say this, but we practice this. So you're not going to learn. You are not Muhammad. Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, you received the Quran, it came down to his heart. That's not to you though. You have to make effort. Okay, he has ikhlas, he puts in time. But he doesn't make dua. It's another problem. You have to make dua every single day. Every single day. And seek the awqat where dua is mustajaba. The dua is accepted. So between adhan and iqamah, in the sujood, in the last third of the night, seek these times and beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Oh Allah, open up the Qur'an for me. So these are some of the ways that we are going to be able to connect with the Qur'an. We are going to mention a few more virtues, inshaAllah ta'ala. I don't want to make the lecture very long because I'm worried if I make it very long, you'll forget the things that I mentioned. So we're going to mention a few more virtues. Then we're going to open the floor, inshaAllah ta'ala, if there are any questions, inshaAllah ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentioned in the Qur'an that the people who have the Qur'an in their life, the Qur'an will guide them to the best of their affairs. قال الله تعالى, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said, إِنَّ هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ يَهْدِي لِلَّتِي هِيَ أَقْوَمْ Indeed, this Qur'an, it guides to the best of your affairs. O oh Muslim, don't you want your affairs to be sorted out by Allah? Don't you want all of your matters to be straightened out by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Alayka bil Qur'an. Upon you is the Qur'an. Because the opposite was mentioned as well. The one who doesn't have Qur'an, he will have to face and suffer in this life a very difficult life. A very depressing life. Sadness for no reason. He doesn't know why he's sad. He's got a house, he's got a family, he's got food. But he's, we're not really happy. Do you know why? The heart has no nur in it. There's no light in it. قال الله تعالى الله يسأل ومن أعرض عن ذكري the one who turns away from my remembrance فإن له معيشة ضنكا he will have a very difficult life in this world it's a promise from Allah رب العالمين ونحشره we will resurrect him رب العالمين يوم القيامة on the day of judgment أعمى blind he can't see anything his eyes will be shut he wants to open them but he can't he will not be allowed to do so قال he will say رب لما حجرتني أعمى Oh my Lord, why have you resurrected me like this blind? وَقَدْ كُنْتُ بَصِيرًا I used to see when I was in the dunya. قال كذلك أتتك آياتنا فنسيتها وكذلك اليوم تنسى Our ayat came to you. The reminder came to you. You heard a reminder like this one. You heard a reminder like other than this one. And you didn't implement. أتتك آياتنا فنسيتها وكذلك اليوم تنسى And on this day, you will also be forgotten. We ask Allah to protect us from this. This is a waqi'. Have you ever asked yourself that this could be you? Are you free? Who gave you a guarantee? You don't have a guarantee. So because you don't have a guarantee, you need to be very scared. اتقوا النار ولو بشق تمرة Prophet ﷺ, he said, Fear the fire, even if it's with half a date. Meaning here the hadith means charity, sadaqah. Fear the fire though. Fear the punishment of Allah, the wrath of Allah, the qadb of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This could be you. If you have turned away from the book of Allah, this reminder, when you come to it, always apply it on yourself. Some of the Sahaba, the people of the past, when they would read the Quran, how was their approach? They would read the ayat of Jannah and they would become happy. Oh Allah, make us from them. Then they would read the ayat like this one of punishment and adab and the anger of Allah and they would become very sad and they would say, Oh Allah, protect us from it. So they are balanced, the Sahaba. They're balanced. They don't think that the verses of Jannah apply to me and I'm free from Jahannam. Nor are they the other way because the other way is not good too. Just you're always scared about Jahannam. And that's not good. But you need to live between al-raja wal khawf. You need to live between hope and fear. So this ayah exists. And the other ayah exists. That the Quran will lead to the best of your affairs. And that ayah did not say your religious affairs. It said your affairs. That means your whole life. That means your dunya and your ukhra. Everything you need, Allah will facilitate. Everything that you ask, Allah will grant. Everything that you desire, Allah will bless you with it. Nothing can go wrong. So the choice is yours. And the other ayah, it says that everything will go wrong. Everything. Even your family members, the relationships you have, whether it is child with parent or whether it is parent with child, 
sibling rivalry, spouses in the community. You find people saying, we have problems, ya akhi. We have problems. I have problems with this person in the community. I have problems with the children. I have problems with the siblings. I have problems at home. I have problems at work. I have a problem with myself in my mind. I have anxiety. I have depression. I overthink. I don't know. My mind doesn't seem stable anymore. People suffer from these things, right? It is because there's no Quran there. There's no dhikr there. The dhikr, it gives a balance. It makes the person balance. Your life is clear. Your vision is clear. Your hearing is clear. Your mind is clear. Your heart is clear. Everything about you is clear. And this is what this ayah of Surah Taha it mentioned. It is also from the virtues. From the virtues of the Quran al kareem as well, is that the parents of the people of the Quran, Yawm al qiyamah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will give them a reward, the likes that He hasn't given to anybody else. The parents of the people of the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will give them a reward, the likes that He hasn't given to any other parent. Yawm al qiyamah the people of the Quran will be called. And their parents, they will be called. In front of all of the people, ajma'een, from the first of them to the last of them. In front of Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. In front of every single human being. This person of the Quran will be given a crown, tajul waqar. It is lighter and brighter than the sun, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said. Clothing will come from paradise. Every single person other than these people, they are in a state of nudity. No clothes, disgraced, dishonor. They're not wearing anything. يُحْشَرُ النَّاسِ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ حُفَاةً لَا نِعَالَ لَهُمْ عُرَاةً لَا ثِيَابَ لَهُمْ غُرْلًا غَيْرَ مَخْتُونِينَ No clothes, no shoes, uncircumcised. Allah, he said, كَمَا بَدَأْنَا أَوَّلَ خَلْقٍ نُعِيدُهُ The same way we created them in the beginning, we'll take them back to that same state. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, أَلَا وَإِنَّ أَوَّلَ الْخَلْقِ يُكْسَى يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ Ibrahim al Khalil, he's the first person to receive clothing. And then the other people that come after. And then the people of the Quran. And then the parents of the people of the Quran. The parents of the people of the Quran, they will say, Bima utina hada. Why have we been given this clothing? My son, my daughter, they are hafad. Not me. I'm not hafad. And if the parent is hafad, that's different. They will get the same reward. But if the parent is not hafad, they will ask this question, like the hadith mentions. How comes we get it? Then it will be said to them, بِأَخْذِ وَلَدِكُمَا Quran. It doesn't matter if you, the father, or you, the mother, have not memorized the Quran. Your son did. Your daughter did, right? Because of this, you are going to be rewarded on this day. And he, all the people listen to me whilst I'm speaking. How do you want to repay your parents for everything they did for you? They raised you. They brought you up. They provided for you. They did everything for you. They protected you. Okay. You just want to get a job and just give them money at the end of every month, that's it. That's a good thing. But is that going to ever repay them for what they did for you? No. And is that going to be something long term? No. You're going to pass away or they're going to pass away. If they pass away first, you can't give it to them, they're dead. Correct? If you pass away, then they can't receive because you're dead. <laughs> so you're stuck. This is something which is very short term. But you can make your parents different from all of the other parents on the day that matters the most, Yawm al Qiyamah. The parents of the people of the Quran only will receive this. Imagine the honor that your mother will receive. Imagine the honor that your father will receive. And this is a su'al, basit, a very basic question, small question. If this taj, this crown, it is brighter than the sun, what kind of nod is going to be on their face? If the crown, it is brighter than the sun. Their face, how bright is it going to be? It's going to be brighter than that even. You have allowed them entry into paradise because of your efforts. It is because of you that your parents will receive mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the niyyah that every single Muslim has to have. Even if the parents have passed away, you can still do this for them. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, إِذَا مَا تَبْنُوا آدَمَا إِنْقَطَعَ عَمَلُهُ إِلَّا مِنْ ثَلَاثِ If the son of Adam passes away, all of the actions they stop except three. One of them it was, what? What was it? وَلَدٌ صَالِحٌ يَدْعُوا لَهُ A righteous son that makes dua, or a righteous daughter that makes dua. Another one, عِلْمٌ يُنْتَفَعُ بِهِ Knowledge that is benefited from. The first people that are going to benefit is the parents. The first people before anybody else. So you have to have this niyyah. It is a very noble niyyah. إِنَّمَا يُعْطَى الرَّجُلُ عَلَىٰ قَدْرِ نِيَّتِهِ Abdullah ibn Abbas, he said, the Sahabi, the cousin of the Prophet ﷺ, حَبْرُ الْأُمَّةِ He said, 
a man will be given by that which he intends. If you intend something noble, you'll be given something noble. If you intend something basit, small, you'll be given something small by Allah. Because you are the one that is doing it. So you have to make this intention, inshaAllah ta'ala. This reward, it is going to be for my parents. I'm going to repay them for everything they have done for me. Another hadith, and we'll conclude with this one, inshaAllah ta'ala. It is that the person of the Qur'an, Yawm Al-Qiyamah, that connected with it, and we mentioned how you connect in the beginning. This person, it will be said to them, Yawm Al-Qiyamah, Iqra, read the Qur'an. Wartaqi, and ascend and go up. Warattil, and read the Qur'an, kama kunta turattilu fi dunya The same way you used to read it when you were in the dunya. Fa'inna manzilataka inda akhiri ayatin taqra'uha. Your station, O oh Muslim, in paradise, it is the last ayah you read. If you know the whole Qur'an, you will be at the highest platform in paradise, the highest place. Where the Prophet ﷺ, he said, if you request from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, don't just ask for al-jannah, ask for jannatul firdaus. Ask for jannatul firdaus, it is the highest place. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, فَإِنَّ سَقْفَهَا عَرْشُ الرَّحْمَانِ The throne of Allah, it is the roof. So this roof above it is the throne of Allah. Look how close you became. Look at how close you became. The people of Jannah, if they enter, they're going to be happy anyway. But you'll be the happiest when you are with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He's in Jannah to Al-Firdaus. Through the Quran, you know you'll reach this high place. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she said, that inna adada ayat al-Quran bi'adadi darajat al-Jannah. Indeed, the number of verses in the Quran, they are equal to the number of stations in Jannah. If you know the whole Qur'an, you'll be right at the top. In the dunya, you are right at the top. In the akhirah, you are right at the top. Another example. We just pray Salat al-Maghrib. We pray Salat al-Maghrib. In the religion, the greatest act of worship, it is what? The Salah. Tayyip. This Salah, which is the greatest act of worship, who is the first person that is going to lead the Muslims? Ya Ummu al-Qawmah, aqra'uhum li kitabillah. The one who is going to stand before everybody else, he is the one that knows the most Qur'an. So the best act of worship in the dunya, the one who stands at the front is not the millionaire. It's not the one that is having a lot of investments and businesses. No, he has to go to the back. This is why I'm saying in the deen, things are very different. The one who can stand here only is the one who knows the most Qur'an. Even at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, a lot of the Sahaba, once they passed away, some of them they said, Oh, Messenger of Allah, we have a lot of people who passed away here from the battle of Uhud. Qatla Uhud. O oh, Messenger of Allah, who do we put it into the grave first? He said, أَكْثَرُهُمْ أَخْذًا Quran." The one who knows the most Qur'an, put him in the grave first. Even in the grave you go in first. The dead person, the thing that he desires the most, it is to go in the grave. So here you are still at the front. In the salah you are at the front. In the grave you are at the front. For the Muslims, Ahlul Qur'an, they are the forefront of the Ummah. Yawm Al-Qiyamah, you will be the highest person as well. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from the people of the Qur'an. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to honor us with the Qur'an. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the importance of the Qur'an and the sweetness of it and to connect with it until we meet him. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us all to be forgiven. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shower us with his never-ending mercy. Wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Are there any questions? Questions, Sheikh, or better no? Is allowed. Sheikh has allowed questions. If there are any questions, we'll take questions. If there are no questions, then alhamdulillah. I don't think there are any questions. Okay. Sheikh Abu Bakr, can I call you one second? Sorry, continue, Sheikh. Continue. So, uh, in the previous generation, I think the Prophet said to the person from the Prophet that you have to die, to be caught and you're made prince of Islam. Is that what you're saying? Okay. I've understood your question. So. So, are you finished? Oh, you're not finished? Okay. I thought that was it. For example, if someone takes, for example, the sin of Qur'an, Fatiha, Sirat, Al Yadina, and Al Fatiha, that is how Qur'an says, and he sees all those are sins. Sure. Yeah. Someone else comes and then he says, Sirat, Al Fatiha. So they can be taken. 
Yes. Yes. So your question, it was one question until the end. Now it became like 10. <laughs> it became a lot. So we'll, bit by bit, the last bit, we'll start with that. That's the most important. That is the foundation. If we understand the foundation, we can answer the rest of your questions. The last bit was which one is which? Which one is which? The answer is they are all Quran. That's the correct answer. The Prophet ﷺ, he said in a hadith which has reached the level of tawatur. Tawatur, it means the highest level of authenticity. It means it is impossible, this hadith is weak. Impossible. He said in this hadith, إِنَّ هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ أُنزِلَ بِسَبْعَةِ أَحْرُفٍ This Qur'an was revealed in seven ahruf. So firstly we say they're all right. Because it's a hadith. We can't go around rejecting hadith now, right? So we can't do this. So the hadith says the Qur'an was revealed like this. And this issue you're mentioning at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, it happened. It happened. Umar radiallahu anhu, in Sahih al-Bukhari, it's mentioned that one time he heard Hisham ibn Hakim leading the Salah. Hisham ibn Hakim ibn Hizam, he's from Quraysh. Umar radiallahu anhu, he's from Quraysh. So look, they are from the same tribe. It's like two people now in South B, for example. They are from the same place, same masjid. Umar, he said, I listened to Hisham lead the Salah. فَقَرَأَ سُورَةَ الْفُرْقَانِ He read Surah Al-Furqan in a way the Prophet ﷺ did not say to me. Umar radiallahu anhu, he became upset at this. And he said, Wallahi, I wanted to grab hold of him in the salah. And I became patient and I waited until he finished. I grabbed hold of him from here. I took him to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. I'm still holding him from here. Ya Umar, arsilhu. Oh Umar, let go of him. Oh Messenger of Allah. Inna hadha qara'a surat al-furqan bi ghayri ma aqra'taniha. He read surat al-furqan in a way you did not teach me. Iqra ya Hisham. Read, O oh Hisham. He read. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, Hakada unzilat. It was revealed that way. وَأَنْتَ إِقْرَأْ يَا عُمَرْ Umar read the way he knows. يعني, example, like you said. One of them said, قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ The Prophet ﷺ said, هَكَذَا أُنزِلَتْ It was revealed like that. He said, قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ هَكَذَا أُنزِلَتْ It was revealed that way. This is right and this is right. And look here. The Prophet ﷺ did not say, after today, don't do this again. Sunnah, it is three types. Sunnah. It is قول, عمل, تقرير. It's a statement of the Prophet ﷺ. This is sunnah. An action the Prophet ﷺ did is sunnah and taqreer. This is an example of taqreer. He affirmed this. If this was going to cause a fitna, the Prophet ﷺ, he's more wiser than us. He knows more than us. He would say, this is right, this is right, but after today, don't do it again. Stop. He did not say this. Another hadith is Sahih Muslim. Ubay ibn Ka'bin, radiyallahu ta'ala anhu, he said, kuntu fil masjidi, I was in the masjid. فَجَاءَ رَجُلٌ A man came. He prayed beside me. فَقَرَأَ قِرَاءَةً أَنْكَرْتُهَا عَلَيْهِ He read a recitation that I made in care of. قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ For example. What is this قِرَاءَ? Another one came. فَقَرَأَ قِرَاءَةً سِوَى قِرَاءَةِ صَاحِبِهِ وَقِرَاءَةً أَنْكَرْتُهَا عَلَيْهِ He read different to his companion and he read different to the way I know as well. قال, he said, فَحَبَسْتُهُمَا I got both of them. وَأَتَيْتُ بِهِمَا إِلَى النَّبِيِّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وسلم. I took all of them to the Prophet ﷺ. So there's three of them now. Each one is claiming this is Qur'an. The Prophet ﷺ said, you read, you read, you read. This is a mahkama. This is a court. Every single one of them, he said, هَكَذَا أُنزِلَتْ هَكَذَا أُنزِلَتْ هَكَذَا أُنزِلَتْ It was revealed like this and like this and like this. And there are many other examples in the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the first part of your question, it's there. But we still continue with your question, a long one. The first part is, we don't do inkar. All of this is from Allah. The second part, which is more important for me, it is what you said about harmonizing the Muslims. So we ask a question. And I want people to answer because the other questions I asked, people were not really answering. It's a very important question. Is harmonizing the Muslims keeping them in the dark and in ignorance from their book? Or is harmonizing the Muslims 
to teach them what is right, for there to be a little problem in the beginning, and then for there to be forever harmony after that. Because if we say the first one, we say, oh, we're not going to do it, we're just going to read in the way that the people in this community know, then that means you're not teaching them that which they should know from the Quran, you're hiding it from them. And that means later on, if it's not this Imam, another one will come. Like for example, you said that Nais and Nas people don't know. There are people in Morocco, in Algeria, in Libya, in Tunis, they are in the, the Maghariba countries, they only know Riwayat Warsh and Nafi'ah. If they come here, you're going to have a fight with them. From Maliki, Yawmiddin, before anything, there's going to be an issue in the masjid. They know Maliki. So they'll come and they'll flip on you. They'll say, why are you doing Maliki? You said to them, why are you doing Azrat? They'll say, why are you doing Maliki? So this is not harmony. The Muslims are going to have problems like this. So the way you deal with it, it is to say, Ya Muslimin, this is your book. Maybe you didn't know before today. Alhamdulillah, you know now. Accept it. Embrace it. Now harmony will come until Yawm Al-Qiyamah. This is the way you do it. The ulama, they say, where do you teach the people these qiraat? You teach the people in the mihrab, in the salah. Even some of the early mashayikh and the ulama, our a'imma, a'immatul qiraat, they mentioned that before they used to write stuff down, they would come to the salah, they would pray behind the imam, and they would note, if, note every single thing he said. Maliki yawm al-din qara'ahu bil qasri. Ihdina as-sirat al-mustaqim qara'ahu bil-seen. Sirat al-ladheen an'amta alayhim qara'ahu bi dhamm al-ha alayhum. They would write it down. And this is how the Muslims, they learn. So the answer to the second part of your question is harmony will only come when the Muslims come out of ignorance. Remaining in ignorance and being scared of something is not harmony. Coming to knowledge, knowledge is light, it is nur. We have to accept it. And I think this is the end of the answer, inshallah. Any other questions? Uh, sorry for the long answer. I think we're done, inshallah. There's no one answer. How long can you finish the Quran? It's different from person to person. One person, it may take him one year, another one ten years, another one five years. It's different. Your ability is different. Your capability is different. The main thing you have to do is remain on the path of the Quran until you meet Allah. You are going to be rewarded being on the path. If you die and you don't finish the memorization of the Quran, you will be rewarded as if you have finished. Because inna mal ahmalu bin niyat, your knee was to finish. But the qadr of Allah came, you passed away. This is the qadr of Allah, you can't stop it. But make the knee, inshaAllah ta'ala, you're going to finish. The Quran is not a race. You don't have to race each other, you don't have to do this. The Sahaba, they had a unique method. They will memorize 10 ayat, they will understand 10 ayat, they will implement 10 ayat, then they would move on. Memorize, understand, implement, then move on. That's why one of them, he would spend years, more than a decade in Surah Al-Baqarah. Like has been mentioned of Umar and Abdullah ibn Umar, his son as well. Some of the reports they mentioned 14 years. When they would finish, they would have a party. They would sacrifice an animal. 14 years on Surah Al-Baqarah, they would finish. And look at this. The Prophet ﷺ in the Sunnah is mentioned one time. He would refer to the Sahaba, some of them as Ashaba Surah Al-Baqarah. It's mentioned in the Sunnah. To show them that they have honor and glory in this book. It's not about finishing. It's about remaining close with it. Wallahu ta'ala alam. Any other questions? Sorry? How many qiraat are there? Ten. Ten qiraat. Nafi'un, Ibn Kathir, Abu Amr, Ibn Amir, Asim, Hamza, Al-Kisai, Abu Ja'far, Ya'qub, Khalaf, Al-Ashir. These are the ten authentic modes of recitation. There are others that exist, but they are not considered authentic by the ulama. Just like there are ahadith which are da'if. But the ahadith which are sahih are known. So there are ten inshaAllah ta'ala. Any other questions? Yeah, Shaykh. Ameen. And you. can't hear a little bit louder. The hadith, yeah, okay. Okay, okay. Excellent question. Okay. Yeah, excellent question. 
You know these ahadith that speak about the reward of the sahib of the Quran. The ulama they say most of them they're speaking about not the hafiz, the one who was close to the Quran. He used to read it, he used to understand it, he used to implement it, so on. However, this particular one of iqra wa taqi wa rattil ila akhir al hadith, this one the ulama they say the majority of them is speaking about the hafiz. Because they say if you haven't memorized it, you're not going to be, where are you going to read from? In Jannah, you're not going to be given an iPad to read from or a Mus'haf. Here's a Mus'haf, read and go up. No. So it's talking about the Hafid. This particular one, it is talking about the Hafid, the ulama, they say. But the other ahadith, the majority of them, it speaks about the one that used to read it, not a Hafid necessarily. For example, اِقْرَأُوا الْقُرْآنِ فَإِنَّهُ يَأْتِي يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ شَفِيعًا لِأَصْحَابِهِ Read the Qur'an because it will come on the Day of Judgment as an intercessor for its companion. Do we say here it means Hafid? No. Anyone that used to read the Qur'an with ikhlas for the sake of Allah, he will come under this hadith. But the one you asked, the ulama, they say it is for the Hafid. Wallahu ta'ala a'ala. Any other questions, inshallah? Again? Okay. Yes. Okay. Did my first answer help you? Is it good? <laughs> Do you agree? I hope so. <laughs> okay. So the question is, sometimes we may see a person violating the Qur'an. So what is our reaction as Muslims? What do we do? First and foremost, we don't know why he's violating the Qur'an. Is he doing it ala ilm or ala jahl? Is he doing it intentionally with knowledge he wants to disrespect the Qur'an? That has a ruling. Or is he doing it out of ignorance that has a different ruling? And before I continue with the answer, I like to give examples from the sunnah all the time that make sense. We know the famous story, a man he came to the Prophet's masjid sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he urinated in the masjid. So the Sahaba, some of them, they got very angry with this man, right? But how was the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's reaction? Very calm. Okay, that's one report. Another report mentions a different man came and he spat. Not urination, spit. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was very upset with him. Okay, which one is worse? Urination or spitting? Urination. Okay, but which one was more serious? The spitting was more serious. The ulama of hadith, they speak about this and they say, the one who urinated, he did it ala jahl. He's a Bedouin. He's a man from Badia. He doesn't know anything. But the one who spat, he knows better. He did it and he shouldn't have done it. So here, we need to discipline him. So you deal with the person based on their mustawa. This person, like one brother, uh, I know this is recorded, so I'm not saying names. There's a brother that I know and it was in the UK. And he makes videos sometimes. And he said the uh, title or the laqab that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he gave the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that he is nadirun mubin. He took this and he said it in a very like, funny, jokey way for YouTube. I saw the video. I called him and I know he doesn't know that it's wrong. I know that he doesn't know it's wrong. So my advice, it has to be a good advice. This is what hikmah is. I can't shout at him because he doesn't think he's doing anything wrong. He thinks it's okay. But I explained to him in a nice way. I said, Ya Akhi, this is the Prophet ﷺ's name you're saying. This is his characteristic you're saying. It's not very nice that you say it in this way. It could be considered to be from the things that takes a person outside of the fold of Al-Islam. I explained it to him like this and wallahi he accepted the advice he took down the video he made tawbah and he said I'll never do this again but if I shouted at him and I said what are you doing you are mujrim you are like this he would get angry with me and say this person this ustad this shaykh or this student of knowledge he's not a very nice person he doesn't know how to advise people his nasiha is terrible that's what he would say so we need to know firstly are they doing it ala ilm ala jahal then when we advise them, we have to advise them in the correct way, with wisdom. What is wisdom? The scholars, they say, you say the right thing at the right time in the right way. I want to advise you now, but there's a lot of people around. I'm going to wait until after Isha. Not now. I want to advise you now, but you look like you're angry. So if I say anything, you're not going to accept it. I need to think. But if we just shout at one who's angry and then he comes angry and I become... There's no khayr that's going to come from this. So our reaction should be from our hearts. We should hate this action. 
the Quran is being violated, like our brother mentioned, or anything about the Islam is being violated. But as for nasiha, we have to ensure, inshallah ta'ala, we do it in the right way, we investigate, and then we advise them.